demonstration. <laughs> so it's really lovely to actually come back and talk about my research, which wrapped up in November of last year. Um, and um, I had a research team that examined our effort in Charlotte and chronic homelessness. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but I'm going to kind of approach tonight in three, in, with kind of three chapters, maybe. So the first one, I just really want to talk about homelessness and how we got to having a, a, such a prominent problem now and dig into the kind of complex causes of homelessness. Then I want to shift over to talking about housing first, because it is an innovation in homeless services that has really shifted the way the entire country and many countries in the world are addressing homelessness. Um, and then finally, I'll give you some, some um, details of the study we just wrapped up in Charlotte, looking at the effectiveness and impact of that effort in chronic homelessness um, that was originally called Zero 2016. <laughs> and then we had, we were gonna end chronic homelessness by the end of 2016. And then by the end of 2018, and by the end of 2018, it kind of shifted and people realized, hey, there's something we've got to do. There's some different work. There was an effort going on across the country to do that. So, um, so anyway, feel free to ask questions as we go. You can stop me, raise your hand. I'm, I'm more than happy to, um, to chat at any point. Um, I will say I came to Charlotte from Richmond, Virginia, where I did finish my PhD, where I also worked in the housing and homelessness sector. And so I got the, the chance to both work at a community development corporation, building affordable housing in the communities in and around Richmond and economic development opportunities. And then I also got the opportunity to start um, the first housing first permanent supportive housing program in Virginia. Um, and so um, that's given me just a lot of, um, I think really helpful insight into how to study study as well. So I'm happy to speak from any of those perspectives. Um, but historically, we have really um, always kind of had something like homelessness with us, right? We, we knew of folks as beggars or hobos, vagabonds, vagrants, bums. Those kind of images are in our historical um, literature. Um, Later, we introduced things like the bag lady, which was a particularly gendered experience of homelessness. Um, but those terms have always been with us and really our perception of homelessness looked a little bit like this. So this is a, a picture from uh, the Roosevelt era, um, but of someone who either a ne'er-do-well, uh, the picture of someone is a ne'er-do-well or the picture of someone who's just down on their luck, couldn't get a job particularly through the depression era. So really that was our, that was our kind of impression and understanding of homelessness for really the first part of the 20th century. We knew it was there. Um, there were usually these um, uh, shanties, flop houses, districts within every city where folks would come to try to find work um, and could rent very cheap housing um, and you know, there was, you could, you could usually find one in every urban or rare, you know, mid-sized city. And so, um, but about the later in the 20th century, um, the faces of homelessness began to change and they began to multiply. And so we began to see, in addition to the men who had been really the, the majority of the homeless population, we began to see more women. Um, and this is late 70s, early 80s, um, on into um, today. Um, we began to see a lot more families. So that at that point, we start to see family homelessness really increase. Um, we began to see veteran homelessness. And that's certainly, we see that after the Vietnam War, we see an increase in the, in the wars we have just been in. Um, we start to see, particularly, and this is even more recent, an increase in unaccompanied youth who are experiencing homelessness. And then finally, um, some of those early pictures I showed you did appear to be older adults, but what we have started to see as of late is people who have not had a history of homelessness and kind of be cycling through homelessness over and over again. We start to see people who've had um, somewhat stable histories now becoming homeless in older age. So there's a different pathway into older adult homelessness now. 
than there was in the early early 20th century. So the unaccompanied youth, are those runaways or? Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, it can be runaways. It, um, and often the, the LGBTQ population is completely overrepresented in this, in this population, often kicked out of their homes or run away so they don't get kicked out. So there is certainly a, de a definite overrepresentation of those youth in that population. It's still a very small part of the population, but it has grown in the past, I would say, decade. What's the youngest you've seen? Um, well, the, you know, the relatives in Charlotte serves, serve folks eight to 12, you know, and they will engage um, protective services if they are of tender age. And so, but we consider unaccompanied youth all the way up to 18 to 22, 24-ish, depends on who's counting. Okay. Um, and so you do, we, we see very few younger folks because they are, they do get scooped up by other parts of the system to care for them, but they go to places like the relatives in Charlotte to get care or into foster care. Are the total numbers going up as well as the increase? Yeah, total numbers are up. And we just let this past week, so you can actually go on to either the Mecklenburg County website to see Mecklenburg County stats or onto our website. Um, did the annual state of homelessness and housing and stability report. And those numbers are going up. We're, nobody's surprised. COVID um, really did a number on the people who were at the margins with work, who lost their jobs, um, lost housing. Evictions were still happening, though we were having an eviction moratorium. So yes, homelessness has increased um, in the past year, most definitely 18 months. Um, so how did we get here? Um, and that's another way of saying what causes this, <laughs> um, which we're always a little bit careful with that causality phrasing because this, like any other social problem, has so many different causes. And so one of the, I think one of the most helpful papers I've read on how to think about the complex causes of homelessness is to think about it in terms of the extent of the problem. So how big is homelessness? And then the distribution of it who is more likely to be homeless, right? And so, so how did the problem get so big? So this is primarily a policy answer, right? So policy through, and you can look at a variety of policies. I'm gonna focus on a couple. One is housing policy, and then looking at, um, uh, we'll, we'll go to um, other supportive services here in a second. So housing policy. Can anyone guess what the racial makeup of homelessness is in, in Charlotte, Mecklenburg? Probably Blacks, African American. It's 80 to 90%. I don't even know what the, what the number is this year. It's close to 90%. It usually hovers around 89 to 91% every year. Latinos of, aren't? No, nope, it's actually a very, very low population of Latinos, whether that is a network support or people remain hidden for, you know, um, for a variety of purposes regarding <clears throat> documentation, but there's usually, it's, it's a very low percentage, maybe 3%. Yeah. Yeah, and it, the extended family networks, right, of, uh, of care. Um, and so housing policy, though, becomes one of the key drivers of how the problem starts to explode in the 70s and 80s. All right. So important with any housing policy, has anyone had the chance to read Color of Law? Um, it is a really a helpful book, just looking at the history of subsidized housing and how we have provided housing um, through, um, through the government. The Color of Law, it's Richard Rothstein. Um, an attorney, and it's a just, it, it's very well written. He was here several years ago to do um, a lecture over on the West End, and it's incredibly powerful and difficult because our entire mortgage system is really set up on redlining. So I'm sure you probably recognize the redlining maps. So redlining literally judged um, what neighborhoods could, could, would be good or bad or medium risk for loans, right? And if you were in a red, a red line neighborhood, and it's redlining, you were, you were not gonna get a loan. And red, red line neighborhoods were black neighborhoods or they were neighborhoods in transition. And those ones in the middle, so 
you'll recognize if you've looked at any of the maps on our Quality of Life Explorer on the Quality of Life Explorer website, which is a partnership between us, the city, and the county, you'll see that kind of crescent and wedge kind of differences for um, out for Mecklenburg County. And in the crest, it's a crescent of poverty around a wedge of wealth, essentially. And so you see kind of those racial differences along that too. And so it actually seems to follow a redlining map because that meant that the, the home loans that were provided at that point um, were provided in, mainly in that green area. And so um, folks would actually, I think it was up until 19, was 68 or 69 when the Housing Act came in, 96% of all loans were provided to white families. 96% of all federally subsidized loans were provided to white families, which really helped. How would you define white? How were they yeah. defining white in there? Yeah, and that you're that's so, a, that's that relevant as an issue, but that's, you, you just got some of those racial things. Yeah, that's there, right. Like, brings the, the question up. That's right. So this is actually thank you for bringing that to, to your to my attention. Um, it's everyone's attention. That is actually from the federal housing handbook, of, uh, one, one of the earlier handbooks. Um, and it's based off of a dissertation by a man named Herbert Hoyt from the University of Chicago, who studied all the racial groups in the, universe, in the Chicago region. So there was, if, if you're familiar with the Chicago School at that time, there's a lot of um, this. Chicago School of so uh, Sociology. There, there are many Chicago schools going on. It's a rich kind of intellectual time in Chicago. And Herbert Hoyt's dissertation, and he goes on to work for um, the Federal Housing um, Administration, which apparently you may know it for Federal Housing Administration. But this is, this is a product of his dissertation where he judged the risks. Um, created a dissertation around the risk, the insurance risk of, of insuring um, housing. So, so are you the, that number 90, almost 96. 90? Oh, 96%. That's a federal number. But like how many, is that only the number one there or is that? No, I don't actually know. That's a good question. I mean, most of the things we see today, white means not black. That's which right. Which is a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, and there, you know, back when this started, one drop roll was a little bit more in, uh, it was, more part of how we address race. But you really do see this kind of gross <laughs> lining up of who is of who's considered more white and who's considered here. less white. What was that? It's a that's a hierarchy. Yeah. Oh absolutely. Yeah. North Italian, South Italians. <laughs> right? Yeah, I can attest to that. Uh, I've submitted a lot of job applications recently. And I wouldn't consider myself white or Caucasian, but I'm kind of pigeonholed to selecting that on the job application yeah. or form. So that is a, a huge risk of you know, just classifying. Uh, well, not really, because uh, race is by anthropology. And so even though you're Latino background or South American background, you're still Caucasian because it goes down to the bone structure. I mean, it, it goes below the skin. Well, that's why the question is important, though, because there is the like, white versus black, and then there's all the nuance. And yeah. depending on the context, one or the other is the issue. Yeah. I, I grew up in South Carolina in the 60s and 70s, and when they said black, they actually did not necessarily mean African. They, they, yeah, meant, they right. consider Latinos, um, Italians. Right. So <laughs> you also need to think about Chicago in the 30s. That's the other thing you need to think about. Who's there? Who's it in who? So you see, like, um, if you've been, you know, going to Chicago, there's a huge um, the Lithuanian and Polish area in Chicago. You know, so it's it's really this was his dissertation. So it was looking at it really became the foundation for public policy in the United States. Um, and so um, so anyway, segregation. So this is that is home ownership, right? Segreg rental housing then becomes consolidated at different times, either in the inner city area. Um, and then as we began to clean up inner cities, 70s, 80s, we end up getting rid of a lot of that stair-step housing, right? Where people could actually come to town to get a job, pay $10, you know, I don't know for how, a very cheap amount for a bed, for a night, and a flop house. Have a place to stay, place to work, move up the ladder, 
the possibility of moving up the ladder with appropriate housing at every income level. We start to clean up our cities, right? All of that kind of, a lot of that housing starts to disappear. Our flop houses go away. Our SRO single room occupancy starts to go away. So we start to lose that housing stock. At the same time, we're having some policy decisions that, you know, essentially we have not had until the pandemic. So we've had some investment during the pandemic in affordable housing because people were scared from a health perspective. Um, but until the pandemic, we had not had significant investment in affordable housing since the early 1970s. So Nixon stopped, created a moratorium in 73. Um, and then Reagan turned a lot of the um, direct payment programs into block grants. And those block grants have steadily not kept up with the demand for affordable housing. Wages have not kept up to pay for affordable housing. Um, and I don't know what, exactly what, what it was, but um, last year it was, you have to work 113 hours at minimum wage in order to afford a, a one bedroom fair market rent apartment in the Charlotte area. You have to work 113 hours minimum wage. Huh? Per week. Wow. Yeah, it's, it, minimum wage does not keep up with the cost of housing. This is, again, this is, you can just, if you look at anything right now. Well, it's kind of a duh thing, too. I mean, Absolutely. If you ever look at a rent, and you look at what the minimum wage is, you don't have to be a math genius. No, it. it doesn't, we, we're, and, and. the things you have to pay, legally have to pay. That's right. With the house, it's, it's and the, a lot to live. And the rent eats first. So all the eviction studies that have come out have noted that the rent eats first. So that's why folks can't afford healthy food, folks can't afford medicines, it, the rent eats first. And if you can't pay the rent, we have the soaring eviction rate right now, right? Um, also fueled by, um, fueled by um, the pandemic, um, market solutions. So in many ways, this is smart, right? You, you pin creating affordable housing on our market solutions um, the way we think of market solutions for fixing a number of things, particularly in the United States. However, there is, you cannot make affordable housing or what they call the capital stack work to pay for folks with low incomes. It just, it, you, there's just no way people can make, it, make, make their money back on the investment. So unless it's heavily subsidized upon construction, there is no incentive to create it. And so that's when you'll hear folks talking about the creation of affordable housing. And often what you hear is people talking about creation of affordable housing at the 80% AMI level. So 80% of area median income, which is around, area median income is around 60,000-ish. Um, 80%, a little bit less. And, and what you really end up, doing the only the only way it becomes the math becomes possible the investment as a private business person or a, or a corporate business becomes possible is with a lot of subsidy and there just aren't enough subsidies to keep up with demand so in many ways this is a supply and demand issue um, but our market solutions without help just can't solve the overwhelming nature of it um, and so then we've just i think um the last stat i read on um, we have one unit for every four people who need it right now, need affordable housing. One unit for every four. There's a great report that comes out every year um, from the joint, I um, can't remember, it's at, at Harvard, the joint housing, I'll get the name of that, I'll remember the name of that. But anyway, that they really help us look na nationally at some of those housing numbers. Um, and so housing policy becomes a huge part of it. We start to see an absolute erasure of housing in the 80s. Um, and so that's when we start to see families becoming homeless, right? So the, the population starts to change quite a bit. Yep. What is uh, what are the boundaries for that uh, area of the income? Yeah, that's a good that there's a small area rent, it's usually by zip code. There are some options for cities to to adjust. Um, and to take that into consideration, but the fair market rent is usually by zip code or defined. Every 
every state and locality have the ability to, to um, I think it's the state that, that creates that issue. That's a good question. I can't remember exactly, but that it, it, it varies and there is some wiggle room when it comes to affordability where folks can name um, a um, area. So for example, if you wanted to build affordable housing in Ballantyne, <laughs> right, right. So there's, there is, but you do have the ability with HUD programs to recognize that the, the fair market rent in Ballantyne does not meet the whole area fair market rent. Um, and so that allows us you to um, actually increase subsidies if, if your housing authority does that. You were also asking about area median income. That's right. You were asking, that's federally set. That's okay. federally set. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not I'm sure. I'm trying to get a sense for. Yeah. Like in, in one city, how many of those, those zones? Yeah, no, it's it's set for the whole it's set for the whole area. Um, so it's I don't remember what what the boundaries are exactly for the Charlotte area. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. What what? Why why were there not very many women before the eighties? There was a there was much more uh, public housing available at the time. Um, so, what was that? Uh, I will say, yeah, so that there is something really interesting. There are some studies that show that, particularly as homelessness starts to increase in the 80s, there are more programs provided for women um, uh, for to get them out of homelessness because it was so shocking for folks. Um, so, affordable, so there was the public housing. This is, again, where this color of law book is so riveting but there was housing being built public housing being built that did support folks it was totally segregated so there was white public housing and there was black public housing totally segregated but it did provide for keeping people out of homelessness the other thing that was happening um, from uh, the roosevelt era into the great society era were a lot of entitlements and those could help um, folks keep, you know, it was still subsistence, but keep a roof over their heads. And so I think a lot of things started to converge in that, that, that period that made, um, made it much more difficult. And so that diminished safety net is the other piece. So our safety net starts to diminish here. And I always have to put a picture of Clinton up here because I think a, a lot of times the, um, the narrative around homelessness is about bad Reagan. And I will say from a policy perspective, I also think bad Reagan, but I also think bad Clinton. <laughs> and so um, you can be equal opportunity on this when you think about the causes of homelessness because there, the, the Clinton administration led um, in the further reduction of what had already started in the Reagan era, which was the diminishment of, of safe of entitlement programs. So if housing is getting more expensive and the rent is eating first, and then you have the safety net programs um, that are turned into block grants, given, uh, yeah, so it, it really was a, a bunch of different programs were, well, that were serving folks for a variety of things, rental assistance, all kinds of different kinds of programs were combined into one grant that devolve, the authority of it devolved from federal government down to state government, state government could start making those decisions. And so often state governments, particularly in the South, made decisions to fund programs that were a bit more palatable to their public. And so I, I remember a slew of stories coming out of this at the 20th anniversary of welfare reform. Um, but that, you know, programs like adoption or marriage support became the programs that were emphasized and that those same dollars that used to support, you know, subs, subs, substance, substance, sustenance, that's what I was looking for, that used to support sustenance programs were now supporting other types of programs that may indeed be necessary, but they weren't keeping people out of home. They weren't helping to keep people out of homelessness, keeping them fed um, and that sort of thing. Um, and so, um, and at the same time, there were increased 
eligibility requirements, right? And so people were having to, it was more of the things instead of entitlement were um, means tested in some way or another. And so it was just a whole change in our social welfare safety net that had some real impacts on homelessness. Yeah, but Clinton is also the one that brought in work there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so, which incentive that kind of perversely incentivized folks to get into very low paying, these low paying jobs with no, no possibility for a future. Yeah. 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 This is not a good thing. So I do get to a little bit of that toward the end, looking specifically at Charlotte, yep. Um, so the other question though, is who is more likely to experience homelessness? And that is both structural and individual factors. And so let's talk about those. So there are structural factors. There are policy pieces that again, lead us into this kind of issue. One, our criminal justice policies. You know, we have the war on drugs at this point. We have three strikes at this point. It becomes very hard with a mark on your record to then get a job. It becomes this kind of cascading cycle. And if you can't find your own path out, this is often where folks end up. Um, there, uh, there are the impacts of war. So, and the impacts of how we transition people back from war. My dad is a Vietnam vet who is completely um, disabled from PTSD, 100% disabled. And so I've lived as a child of um, veteran trauma um, for my life. Um, and he had this robust support system around him, um, and which was mostly my mother, who is, you know, like, like every spouse of someone um, who's experienced trauma over functions. <laughs> um, and, um, but I know so many of folks that I've gotten to know through him who were Vietnam veterans have been homeless. It was just a part of, they couldn't hold it together long enough or they couldn't get access to their benefits and they were addled to such a degree, um, which, you know, my dad had us saying, you know, you know we're, we're helping out here um, and pushing on to get his benefits he needed, um, but so addled um, that they don't get the, the kind of transition type services really bad during the Vietnam War, right? Um, we've gotten a little bit smarter now, but the homeless rates are still up after Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, so deinstitutionalization, we shut down mental hospitals, right? Um, and so that really, there, a number of studies have looked at this and, um, because a lot of people think that's the cause of how many people we have homeless, but you know, there have not been studies that have directly linked this huge rise in homelessness to deinstitutionalization. It does mean though, that if you have a mental health, um, um, issue, you are more likely, and you can't find help in the community, which the institution, the institutionalization was supposed to provide, right? Don't do hospitals, do community-based care. Funding never followed for the community-based care. So at that point, you have no hospitals, you have no community-based care. People go into jails um, and into hospitals for care um, and into home, homeless shelters. Right, so that's just a, that's a part of that path. So if you talk to someone with a serious and persistent mental illness, it is more than likely that they've experienced homelessness at some point in their life. Even if you wouldn't think of them as a homeless person now, it's just, a, it's, a, it's a part of, it is sadly a part of our service system for folks experiencing serious, serious mental illness. And of course, labor policies. Um, as I mentioned before, a, a, um, a minimum wage that has not kept up a late with, um, with the cost of housing and, and other. So, but there are individual factors with caveats because some of these are really, like I mentioned, really structurally related, um, but lack of education. And you just cannot translate into um, the workforce. Um, substance use, 
um, is overrepresented in homelessness. We don't know if that's a cause or effect. There's not, there's not been good research. We know it's overrepresented, but is it an effect from being homeless or is it a cause or is it both? Um, so health and mental health, trauma and limited resource networks um, where you have no one else to ask to come in. And if you think about the racial wealth gap, so we know that for the, the, race, the wealth of white families is 10 times that of um, uh, black families, eight times that of Latin X families. Um, there's, there's often no wealth to rely on. Um, so people can actually, you know, buy a home, put a down payment down, you know, put a security deposit down. And often family members in those networks are also struggling. And so there's just really limited resource networks that might help you pull out of something that we've probably all known somebody in our family who's needed help pulling out of something. Um, and we had probably maybe deeper pockets to help, help out. And so all of these really create um, homelessness. You know, it's really, it is a complex issue. There are um, structural and policy issues at root. There are individual issues at, at root as well. And so all of those combine to make a really what we call a wicked problem. Um, poverty is a wicked problem. There's so many, so many tentacles. It's hard to figure out exactly where to intervene to have a more, um, to have a decent impact. So that makes the next part of what I'm going to talk about kind of incredible. <laughs> well, you forgot the endemic one. <laughs> yes, I know. That's a, that's a really good, that's a really good point. Um, and I don't know how many folks had driven by the tent city, which um, in, in Charlotte, when it was up, um, it was, it was kind of, and if you've been in LA before the pandemic, um, to see the kind of, um, kind of visible homelessness. Tent City was really around um, the loop 277. If you get, so on one side of the loop, it's really close to a couple of different shelters. Um, no, 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 it's a little bit more toward, um, you know, it's like at going up Tryon. If you're going North Tryon, there's um, the, the men's shelter is there and they have a, a lot in the back and they let people camp there because people were scared, scared to go in. And was, you know, it was before vaccines and everything. And then along the highways and like right where you would exit off the highway, it was, and that's what reminded me so much of LA because it was, that's what you see in LA all the time. You get off the freeway in LA and there's a tent right there um, in downtown and it's many tents. And so it was the same thing. People were passing out tents and it was eventually closed down. Uh, Gibby Harris closed it down because it was a public health crisis because of the rat infestation. But it was up for quite a while. It was up for a long time. Yeah. And I mean, it was big. It wasn't just yep. like fire again. It was. Yeah. Yeah. And people, you know, there's so many reasons that, I mean, people felt safe there. They didn't feel safe. I have done life history interviews with um, older homeless adults and, you know, what, what I heard over and over and over again, or people, particularly men, were scared to go into the men's shelter. They were scared. I heard, I saw big, burly men say that they didn't want to be in the shelter because it was a scary place to be. So is it scary because they were afraid of getting COVID or be, they were afraid of getting attacked, abused, or? I think it was COVID prior to that, um, recently. I think when I did those interviews, it's probably been seven years ago. And it was, it was violence. It was, it's just a place of desperation. You put desperate people in a place. It's, it's just not a good combination. And people do come in, you know, and you, you add alcohol and drugs to any mix of any, any people, you're going to have more trouble as I stand with the best one. <laughs> just, I just noticed, um, <laughs> I can get us all into trouble. So, um, so let me transition into chronic homelessness because it is a particular definition and it's really the group of folks who really um, are experiencing a lot of those individual factors that we talked about. Um, so the federal definition, there, there is a federal definition of chronic homelessness and it is a person with a disabling condition, mental health, substance abuse, um, HIV AIDS, um, uh, developmental disability, 
um, physical disability, chronic illness. So any of those things. What's the subset of people classified as chronic illness uh, as opposed to the population? Yeah, it is a it is typically in most cities from ten to twenty percent. It's about eighteen percent, I think, in Charlotte. So, and that's the real kicker because that smallest percent of our homeless population uses the vast majority of the resources. All right, so they, in one study in Philadelphia and New York, the t they were 10% of the population, they used 50% of shelter resources. Um, and so that's what got the federal government's attention. So the president who has done the most for chronic homelessness has been George W. Bush. He had the mental health, he had mental health legislation going on. Um, and and now I'll, I'll give a caveat to that in a second as well. But he really started to believe in this housing first. He heard, saw this research. Um, his, his staff heard the case and there was a, a, a guy named Phil Mangano who was, I will swear he was, the, he was an evangelist of um, housing first. And, and getting this small subset into housing. Um, and so um, at the same time, he was further cutting programs for families, right? So there is something that's happening there that if you pay attention with, to inner homeless service politics at any point, you'll see that there is really kind of a rift within those, those service providers of who is more worthy of services, with scarce resources, and now we're starting to serve the folks who look like those original homeless people to start with, right? So it's, a, it's really, it can be an interesting political space within the homeless services sector as people really vie over very scarce resources to address homelessness. Um, so, but chronic homelessness also means you have experienced extensive periods of homelessness, at least one year um, solid or four more times in a three-year period that equal one year. And so that's the federal definition. And so what happened during the Bush administration is they actually started um, focusing on what would happen if we house these people. And so all these plans to end chronic homelessness popped up across the nation. And people started to really work on putting these folks in housing. Um, and, um, and what I'll tell you about in just a second is um, there was an intervention that was actually working to keep people in housing. And so it was reducing costs. And so um, Sam Simbaris, um was um, a psycho is a, psycho a psychologist in New York. Um, and at that time he was working on the street and he was forcibly having to remove people from the street to keep them from freezing. And he was so frustrated at the kind of, um, that kind of human interaction of having to, to literally force, physically force people off the street against their own will um, in order to save them, that he was like, there's got to be a better way. And so he started asking people who were experiencing homelessness what they wanted. And they were like, I just want a place to sleep. It's not as scary as the shelter. Um, and so, he was just enough of an outsider um, that he was able to create um, this pilot program that paired um, a really effective psychiatric service called assertive community treatment, which is often considered a hospital without walls because of the intensity of the, of the treatment. So this is not housing only. This puts people in, in a house and then wraps incredibly um, evidence-based treatment around. Them. So he, he, took, he took two programs together that would work federally, smacked them together, did a pilot program, and had incredible results. Let me see where I have that slide. Um, I'm going to skip this for a second, but I wanted to show you the results. Um, so he started this result and he finally, he looked at administrative data for a little while and then he did a randomized control trial. He's a psychologist. Sam Simbaris. Yeah, he is, um, he is great. He's actually, he was a consultant down here in Charlotte. I got to work with him in Richmond to start the Housing First project. 
and he's he's just a very innovative thinker and he's just he's outside the kind of the usual um and that's led to some issues that he had in new york but um 80 of the folks in the housing first program and let me just say these were folks with a serious and persistent mental illness schizophrenia um these were folks that people said could not be housed. And he knew people wouldn't believe him. And he was a community psychologist who had been just trained and trained on doing research. And he was like, we're setting up a randomized control trial. And sure enough, the folks who were in housing first, 80% of them were still housed after two years, 30% in the treatment as usual group. And so, I cannot tell you how much this innovation plus another piece of research that was happening at UPenn shifted our entire homeless services system. Um, the research that was happening at UPenn was that 10% um, of the population um, using up 50% of the resources. So there was, a, there was a cost argument to be made here. What if we could get these folks housed, this 10%, what would that open up to then begin to solve the rest of the homelessness problem? Um, and so, but what, what Sam and others had encountered was this well-meaning product of federal policy. <laughs> the McKinney-Vento Act was established in the 80s because people were concerned about seeing homeless families, homeless kids, more visible homelessness. And the McKinney-Vento Act meant that it was, it's, I would call it mandated collaboration. <laughs> the federal government said, all of you organizations serving the homeless, if you wanna get federal money, you're gonna to have to form a continuum of care and you're gonna to have to set up a system by which you serve the homeless people in your community. And so I think rather unintentionally, what happened was this system got set up. People have a housing crisis. They are sent into emergency shelter. The assumption at that point was that people aren't housed because they're not housing ready. And so let's get them housing ready and transitional housing, and then we'll pass them on into permanent housing. A few things wrong with that, <laughs> with that, those assumptions. One is there wasn't their permanent housing was going away. So even if, if that, even if everything worked perfectly, at the end, there wasn't enough affordable housing to get people into. The second problem was having was eligibility criteria. People, that 10% were getting stuck in the shelters and in hospitals and in, that, in jails over and over and over again because they could never meet the eligibility criteria to get into transitional housing. So that's why they kept using up the resources over and over and over again. And so Sam was like, this is stupid. Let's just put people in housing. Let's just, I think it'll work. They're asking for it. I think it'll work. And again, it did. And so the housing first continuum began to look more like this. And this is what we're kind of in now. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it doesn't work good. Sometimes people have assumed housing first means housing only, which can be really problematic if you are someone who needs a lot more support. Um, but sometimes we've spent too much support. We've spent too much money on people who don't need, they really need a place to stay and they need some support along the way, maybe an introduction or two into a job possibility, and then they can go on their way. 80% of people who come into homelessness are only there one time. It's the smaller percent that are episodic and chronic that end up using the most resources. Everybody else is in and out, they stabilize. Um, and so the housing first permanent supportive housing that Sam created and that I've been a part of studying here in Charlotte and started in Richmond really said, really was based on some really kind of groundbreaking things that are also still a little bit controversial. Um, first of all, that you maximize choice in housing. So people were actually given in Sam's program a choice of three apartments in Manhattan, in Manhattan Lee Burroughs three apartment choices. That might be really hard right now, but at that point they were offered three choices. They often took the first one, but choice was a novelty. And Sam knew the, the research that says choice is related to your ability to feel like you can do something. 
Um, and so it was just a very powerful part of the model. Separating housing from service compliance. So it really, you don't have to take part in services and you don't have to succeed in services to stay in housing. That is, this is super hard and it can be super controversial. So this is considered a harm reduction. This is, harm, this is kind of harm reduction. So the, the idea, that's the second one as well, but to start, separate housing. The housing, the person helping a person in housing is literally, that's what they're trying to do. They're serving that person versus the landlord who has a different set of, has a different set of concerns. And they, are, they can be very legitimate concerns, but that's why you separate it. So you have two advocates trying to figure out the best solution versus the landlord saying, hey, this person's out. And the advocate saying, this person needs to stay forever. So coming together, there's a different kind of solution. Um, that voluntary person-centered services, that is um, really that kind of harm reduction perspective um, that, yeah, we recovery, is a process people are you know we know that recovery is a process for mental health issues we know that recovery is a process with substance use issues um we we need to build those assumptions in do our best to reduce harm in the meantime sometimes that's needle exchange that's where that gets really controversial but a lot of times that is literally i've watched service providers sit down and say i want you to drink three beers today and not eight that's harm reduction. And getting people toward those three versus that eight is a huge victory. And those are the stair steps that start toward recovery. Very different, we're kind of an all or nothing kind of society, particularly in the United States. Harm reduction is much more normal in Europe. Um, but this was really a key part of it as well. Provide the range of services. Again, it's not housing only. People need mental health care. People need substance use services. The idea is to still get people toward a place where alcohol is not destroying or drugs aren't destroying their lives. So there need to be services that help people toward that. Um, mental health, employment, gainful activity, provide those services. So it is a wraparound services. And then you need to have a program structure to support that. So a lot of programs and homelessness were like 75. Um, to one case management ratio, 100 to one case manager to um, client ratio. Um, and so this one is like 10 to 12 to one, changes how you can work with a person. So what are those, what needed to happen in the structure? And so, so I was gonna say, so where do you find the permanent housing for them? Yeah, it's on, so there are a couple ways it's been done. Sam is an advocate of, um, and I think the separation of housing and services is easier if you do scattered sites. So you're just finding, um, you're finding affordable housing where you can find it and on the private market. And so, but there is something like, if you've heard of more place in Charlotte, that where it's a unit has been built, right? Um, and there are affordable units in it for folks who are experiencing homelessness. So there's either a single site or a scattered site model. So it is hard though. That was one of the big things that we found locally is it's really hard that the housing that's affordable for folks is disappearing by the week in Charlotte. But didn't I hear that there was, that the city, and maybe I just made, dreamt this, but that the city of Charlotte bought up um, a motel, hotel, yeah. and was remodeling it yep. for the homelessness? Yeah, okay. yeah, I, I, yes, there's just not enough, there's just not enough of it. But yes. I also was hearing about when they were like, Closing them down, the health department or whatever is closing down the place where people are living. Yeah. Because it's the place nobody should live. But where are they supposed to go? If That's I mean, right. Is it worth it or worse than living on the That's right. And that's a, those are hard questions to answer. I remember doing a focus group with service providers who were so distraught and it, they named the street. I mean, over and over again, I would have both people experiencing homelessness or, and had just been housed and service providers saying, you know, they put me on Rachel Avenue and it's just a den of drugs and I'm scared and I can't. And one service provider saying, I wouldn't put a dog on Rachel Avenue. And that's, but that's where the affordable housing is. Right? So it's just really messy kind of issue. But what we did find is it's, you know, 
Sam found this is, and his research team, this is really effective. Um, and by the mid 2000s, we were finding out in city after city that these were hugely high retention rates. People were being housed, uh, who, the unhousable were being housed without all this prep work at really, really high rates. And so it was really effective. And that just started the federal government and governments around the world thinking about, we've got to rethink how we're doing this. Our entire system should shift to housing first. Um, and that's what we have been shifting to. It was also efficient. So this is one of the major and more rigorous um, cost studies to come out. And the New York, New York housing study looked at administrative data and looked at costs around um, a pre post um, housing when people are housing housing first with a comparison group um, looking at housing um, before um, look at the comparison group um, was yeah the average cost of someone who's homeless per year was forty thousand the average cost when they're housed in permanent supportive housing was twenty four thousand and that was based on looking at jail costs er costs social services cost. Uh, I think they also looked at veterans costs around those. And so that portion, is, you know, was a that was left over was about 16 to $17,000, which will allow you to pay for the, the permanent supportive housing each year, right? So it broke even. There did become, and I understand totally getting caught up in this because I was a service provider too. There was, kind, there is kind of this, um, more simplistic research way of just doing pre-post without a comparison group. And when you do pre-post without a comparison group, it can really inflate those numbers and you have huge cost savings. And it really is a little bit more moderated than that. And so it, it, it isn't a windfall. You know, some communities like to think, oh, we'll just house everybody and it'll be a windfall. Not quite that. There are good cost offsets. We don't expect any intervention in any other realm to pay for itself, right? We don't expect cancer to pay for itself, cancer treatment to pay for itself. We don't expect a number of things to pay for themselves. And this doesn't quite either, but it's a really important cost offset. And I can give you some more recent numbers here in a second. So again, cost reductions certainly pre-post, their cost offset may or may not be overall cost savings, but it's still a more efficient use of funding overall. You're paying for it one way or another. So it sounds like this uh, housing first system is <clears throat> it's really a better system than it was before. So what is the resistance? So I assume that you know, there's a lot of places that still haven't converted. So what's the yeah. resistance? Um, I think there's there's a lot of it. And some of it isn't people. Some of it's just the system that makes it hard to work. What do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a that's a you you've just anticipated part of the implications of only focusing on chronic homelessness and not focusing on the rest, right? So we have a good solution and pathway in Charlotte to get chronically homeless people out. We don't have as good a solution for folks who are who are not don't meet that chronic threshold or aren't as, um, aren't as in need, right? So they could be, they can meet the chronic homeless threshold but they're higher functioning. And so we really, it really, our efforts, and that's part of the findings from the study that I was a part of. And so this is the, um, you can actually go on and you can read these. There's probably more than you ever want to read. I'm always impressed if anybody's read it because we put everything in there, the research team. But there's a, um, this is, looks like there's the process evaluation and we also did an outcomes evaluation. So we were looking at how effective was, you know, did we implement it like we said we were gonna implement it and how effective was the overall effort. And then we looked at, we followed 300 people for almost four years um, to see how they did pre and post housing. And we had a comparison group. It wasn't random assignment, so it's not a randomized control trial, but it was much more rigorous than anything we've ever done in Charlotte and allowed us to compare how people did with housing and without housing and take out the effect of the folks who, who um, 
didn't have housing, right? And so it's, it doesn't overinflate the effect of something. But these were some of our questions. Was it implemented as intended? Who was served? How were services delivered? The impact of this whole, we created this public-private partnership of we're going to end chronic homelessness in Charlotte, right? And so how, how did that project management structure work? Um, what was the role of collaboration? What did that look like? What were the problems encountered? How did we address them? Um, did it improve housing, health, mental health, social outcomes? Um, how did it compare to people in usual services? And, and with services utilization, um, was, it, was there a community impact on services? Um, and were there any cost savings or efficiencies? So we spent, I spent five years of my life doing this. Um, so the good news is over a thousand people were housed and 70% of them stayed in housing um, uh, a year and a half after. And I, we, that's when we had to stop following because we ran out of money. Um, but another really important thing happened is we were able to use that sample, that smaller sample we were following and look at those 165 and see who was doing better and what kind of housing, right? We had several different housing settings going on. So the people who were in um, permanent supportive housing and other, which included people who got house on their own. Um, so that was actually a very small group, um, but people in permanent su supportive housing did really well. That's the darker blue. Um, and they remained in housing. Um, overall, it was for our small sample, it was 65.5 who remained um, in housing and it were continuously housed. Um, that light blue is they had a positive exit. So that means they found their own housing, went into another program. The yellow was a negative exit. So that means they're either back in the homeless system again or jail. Um, and so, um, and you really quickly kind of see, all right, the, the housing, the permanent support of housing, the other, again, that's primarily folks who were going, who were functional enough to find housing on their own. That's primarily how that worked. They found housing on the real market on their own. Um, rapid rehousing <clears throat> is a short-term subsidy, not as many services, didn't work quite as well, 45%. Um, and then people were placed with family members, also didn't work as well, no supportive services. No, yeah, so people didn't have the kind of service and they didn't have a subsidy. These are all, these are all chronic homeless. Yep. So, I mean, chronic homeless, if their family house had really the resources to house them long term, probably wouldn't be chronic homeless. That's right, that's right, um, yeah. Because I'm sure there's tons yeah. of people in Charlotte and everywhere that are rehousing with family that they would otherwise be homeless in. That's right. Yeah, and so it, I think it was important to put this in writing because that was one one of the narratives was that, you know, let's just get people back into any housing. Well, that might not be the best solution. I know up north, um, you know, we had government subsidized housing, mm -hmm. of course we called it deployment. But I don't really see that much in the South or even in Charlotte. Yeah, we, we, we do. You might not recognize where it is because we've been, since urban renewal, when a lot of our, our projects were torn down, they were replaced with mixed income housing, which has housing for the lowest incomes up to housing for the highest incomes in an effort to deconcentrate poverty. And so that's good and that's bad because we know that the concentration of poverty is a bad thing. However, those housing units for poor people were never replaced. So a lot of that federal funding that went to get rid of blight which is also, you have to kind of look at the, the racial history on that too, but what communities were really targeted <laughs> to get rid of blight. Um, you know, the, the whole second ward in Charlotte was a very active Brooklyn community and is now gone. The, that land is worth tons now, right? I was just thinking a lot of those places, I don't know what second ward is, like over it's government center. Houses. They're all the new apartments. Government center. So there's new apartments all over the place, but I know they're over the Piedmont. Yeah, and some of that years ago, right? And that's uh, there may be a little bit left, but it's not. There's but, not much. But all those areas, yeah, they, they've definitely gotten developed with extensive stuff. Oh, absolutely. But that, I, I think the city needs to focus on that. Uh, even if it's like one section that they can put that. And they are. Housing. 
The problem is the capital stack doesn't work. Braiding together the money to make affordable housing does not work from a bottom line perspective. It just, I mean, it, so that's why you have four units that serve people at 30% AMI or less. So the people making minimum wage, you'll see an, a big affordable housing unit um, development come out. There might be four units in that that will serve people. We're short 34,000 units of housing in Charlotte Mecklenburg for the 30% below, 34,000 units. And we're doing four or five units. So it is, it's inc the tentacles are incredible because you can't simplistically blame a mom and pop developer because they just can't make the cap, you can't make the capital work to build housing. So you can't simplistically do that. At the same time, if we don't have some sort of other intervention, this is only gonna get worse, right? Um, so I, I just have a few more slides and I'll kind of wrap up and we can talk about any more questions, but. The impact of housing is measurable. So that's what one of the really exciting things of those five years of my life is to actually watch that, how that worked. And so we use standardized measures for quality of life, for mental health symptoms, for trauma symptoms, um, and for substance use. And we saw improvements in all of them, statistically significant improvements compared to the people who were not housed. And so it was a very rigorous way of looking at this. Um, we also saw that folks who are housed, super no surprise on any of these. If you're housed, you're gonna spend fewer nights in an emergency shelter. You're not going to get arrested and incarcerated. So we did look at the charges that people got when they were arrested. You wanna guess what they were for? At, at not as much, there were, there were a number of shoplifting to get things to survive, but the most was this kind of, um, trespassing, public urination, public drunkenness. Uh, if I get a little tipsy in my house, <laughs> nobody's gonna know, right? <laughs> if you get a little tipsy in a public park and you don't look like you showered for a while, police are gonna take you to jail, right? And so the majority of those crimes, that, that's not to say there weren't serious crimes, there were, but the, ma the vast majority of crimes, first of all, most of the people weren't jailed at all. That's important to know. Of those who were, they were, they were about not having a place to go to the bathroom. So um, fewer, um, fewer health department visits. So that's a really interesting. And that's really one of the first health departments that's been studied around the country. Um, but people go to health um, um, departments for sexually transmitted diseases um, to, to get testing, um, to get a variety of, um, of basic services. And so as people get housed, these housing programs connect them with primary care physicians, right? And so they become, they become engaged in healthcare in a different way. Um, fewer ER visits, that's, that's the big, that's one of the bigger um, things. And then interestingly, more use of crisis assistance ministry. So crisis assistance ministry has financial support and clothing and furniture, right? And we actually took the furniture out of our analysis here because everybody when they move in needs furniture and, and crisis was providing the furniture. But just because your house is a homeless person doesn't mean you're not poor. Anymore. And so these folks once housed then become the part of the effort to keep them housed, right? When you're on, on the margins. And so, um, so we did see a little uptick. And Here's where, I don't know how well you can see this. If we looked at those annualized costs over um, pre and post housing. Yeah, feel free to get up. It's, I, I cut and pasted this and I put it on black so you can see it a little bit better. But annually it was uh, saving about $1,000 um, for shelter, a little bit less than that for jail, Twice that for emergency department, some of that for ambulance transport, um, 655. And, but there was a more expense in outpatient health. That's actually a really good thing, right? Because people aren't going to the emergency room. They're going to see a primary care physician. Cheaper. <laughs> and there was actually a $77. That's a crisis assistance ministry. This is per person. This is per person. Yeah. A average and annualized cost. And so 
there is a cost savings to this. Is it enough to pay for the whole thing? I, I can come back to this and it looks more. No, it's not quite enough to pay for it. But it does take it down to a cost that seems really doable um, in terms of, um, uh, of the offset. So the annualized offset, we did a cost study of how much it costs to provide the housing and it cost us Right, right around what it costs in the country. Some places are a little bit more expensive. Some places are a little less. It costs an average of $17,000 to provide a unit of affordable housing a year, of, of, of permanent supportive housing a year. You save that in community costs. Um, and then of course, that, that leaves a, a reduced cost. Again, not offset, but still probably a much more efficient use of funding um, than the other. Um, and so, there were other lessons learned from the study. Um, so it wasn't just all not great, exciting, great outcomes that we were excited about. There were also some important lessons learned for the community. One is that we have, a, a, um, and many communities in, in 40 states around the country, we use something called the VI SPDAT, which is the Vulnerability Index um, Prioritization Data Assistance Tool. Um, I can't remember the essence for it. Um, but that is our way of figuring out how do we prioritize people for housing? So how vulnerable are they? Um, and a higher score means you should be housed more quickly. But what we found is what has also been found in the uh, Pacific Northwest is the score, it was scoring white people higher than it was scoring black people. And so again, it's really tricky how this stuff gets really how built. It is. What is it about white people? That kind of <laughs> well, it was exploring it. The the so the study in the Pacific Northwest, ha, I think it has like eighteen indicators, mm -hmm. and eleven of them predicted the vulnerability of white people because vulnerability itself is racialized in in some ways. So white vulnerability was mental health more likely to spend. Um, it was substance use related. It was a whole lot of substance use. Historically, um, African Americans have distrusted the mental health system. Um, they do also have, um, compared to some of the white folks, different kinds and more extensive networks, even if they're not resourced, um, than white people do. Um, so it really is some really interesting differences. And if you just write one, <laughs> you know, like this instrument's going to measure vulnerability for everybody, you're going to miss it. I mean, that's true if you think about the difference between what vulnerability might look like in Matthews versus what vulnerability is going to look like in Uptown Charlotte. I mean, I'm from East Tennessee. I mean, you would, you would, there are some things that would just look different from a rural urban perspective, right? Um, and so it was a, it is an instrument that is now, it like finally caught on that we've got to just scrap this thing. And quite frankly, from a science perspective, the wrong, the due diligence wasn't done on it. There was no psychometric testing done on this instrument. And so there was no clarity that this actually measures what we say it's gonna measure. And you'd, you'd go through the process of norming standardized measures on different populations to make sure it works with different populations. None of that was done on the Diaspora app. And so it had just a really um, evangelical developer. <laughs> so um, address the project infrastructure improvements. So we created this big public-private partnership and then we quit communicating when the going got rough. Um, we didn't sustain project management over time. And so if you have a very um, a scattered and fragmented infrastructure um, and you're trying to do a big event, a big effort like this to end chronic homelessness and you don't have somebody managing project management, it's not gonna work out so well. So we did that. The housing first response. Um, Food security got worse. Once people got housed, their food security got worse. Food insecurity, sorry. Their food insecurity got worse. So wh what do you think was happening? They, well, it got worse. So they, it, no, so they couldn't afford the food. They couldn't afford it and they were put in food deserts. They were put in places where there was the affordable housing and there's, these are folks without cars. So all of a sudden you can't get to the soup kitchen you've been going to for the last five years. You're, you're hungry. 
And so that was just a big aha for everyone because we hadn't paid attention to food security, right? Um, and so, and then of course, the other housing programs. Um, some, some of those were more effective than others and we learned kind of as a community what those were. And then, um, and that philosophical piece was really hard. <laughs> you know, that philosophical shift that I was talking about around harm reduction, if you don't support it, the people aren't gonna get any services that they need. And then finally, connecting to that system context, right? So other things were going on in the system. Um, affordable housing was going away. So really the kicker, we've housed a thousand people, but a ton more people were becoming homeless every, chronically homeless every day. Yeah, do you tell them more of the not chronic homeless couldn't find a house? They, because... aged, they aged into chronic homelessness. Yeah. They mm -hmm. aged into chronic homelessness and we couldn't stop the inflow. Because there's a, a set number of house, housing Yeah, and people couldn't get out home. and then more people were coming in. And so we- It's getting worse every year. It is. And it's like none of, none of this can really do the sort of change you want it to do if there aren't enough places for people to live. That's right. And so there's a new planning process going on in Charlotte that's a 2025 plan that's looking at broader the broader continuum and more populations, right? So it's also looking at families and children. Um, but the new, they've taken the lessons from the study and they've said, all right, this is about affordable housing. The same things that are causing our issues with economic mobility in Charlotte are the same things that are causing our problems with homelessness in Charlotte. And so we have to look at this from a systems context, but that also very hard because the, the, it is, again, that capital piece is so hard in creating affordable housing. Um, and that's, that was it. Yeah, so I can I can send you a copy of this. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, and you can and you can share it. You can read all the reports, um, and then you can go and read the the um, the um, Washington Post article on Sam, which is really interesting. Kind of understand the history of that, where that's being used across the world now. Um, but yeah, anything I can. <laughs> well, I got lots of questions. <laughs> Y'all have been great. <laughs> Well, one of the things I was thinking about is that there's quite a few people that did, you know, they lost their jobs because of COVID mm -hmm. and, and became homeless because of that. Now they weren't a chronic homeless. Person. Right. But when you have somebody like that who's homeless, who's willing to work, and now there's, you know, such a, a, a labor shortage and the jobs are there, but how can they do that when they don't have an address, they don't have a vehicle to get them to work? I mean, have you guys, is there any kind of system implemented to help them, to give them the rides or to have a PO box, you know, or something yes to get no. them back on their feet. Yes and no. Um, so there are all kinds of service providers and there is something called coordinated entry in Charlotte now, which is supposed to, you're supposed to be able to call 211 in Charlotte Mecklenburg. 211 will screen you. And if you are, um, if you meet a certain threshold, you'll be sent into doing an assessment in the homeless services system. But if you don't meet that threshold, which means you're not 14 days out of losing your actual housing, you have to be 14 days out, um, then you're just given research, you know, a website. So it really is almost impossible. And in some ways, I see where the coordinated entry system is going and we're doing an evaluation on coordinated entry at the Urban Institute right now. I see where they were headed, right? Part of what was happening in the homeless services system before is people were doing what you call creaming, which is you take the most um, functioning people because they are good for your outcomes and they're good to be able to say, hey, this person can be housed. So it can be from an outcomes perspective or it can be from a worthiness perspective. Like this family seems a little bit more worthy than this person who's using alcohol all the time. So there's a lot of creaming going on. And what the Housing First stuff told us is that is not an effective way to do it. You actually need, you need to house the folks who are almost at the, the worst part first and let that, and truthfully, even I think that's a bad assumption. I think we're, we keep having these conversations in the context of scarcity, right? Where we're, you, you just by nature are pitting one population against another and who's more worthy or less worthy for housing. Um, so a lot of it's like it's it sometimes isn't available. The good news about I think that the 
housing, how housing first has helped is it's reminded people that not everybody needs this whole, just because you're homeless does not mean you need parenting classes. Sometimes it does, but sometimes if you're housed, you need parenting classes, right? So it could just mean you need six months of rent and you need your security deposit paid for and you need your rent arrears paid for. And then you're back on your feet. Yeah. And in fact, over and over, the numbers have shown that people come in once, they self-adjust, they're on their way. It is not a, to a luxurious lifestyle. It is back into poverty. But people tend to not, um, for the most part, people tend not to be homeless for a long period of time. It is interesting the patterns of homelessness between families and individuals. Families are particularly vulnerable when they're young and they have young children. And that's where you see the, in, the, the, that's the, that's the vulnerability of families. They start to, the kids start to grow up, the parents start to grow up, they find some equilibrium, they get some assistance, they're out of the homeless system. It's only a small group of families who stay in the system. Chronically homeless folks, we know that the majority of the folks who are experiencing chronically home, chronic homelessness who are older came out of what one of um, the main researchers on um, kind of home, overall homelessness trends in the country, Dennis Colhane in Pennsylvania, calls the disco generation part of the baby boomers. So that latter part of the baby boomers, when if you think about everything that was happening there, economic recession, the war in Vietnam is ending, deinstitutionalization is happening. Um, <laughs> um, the war on drugs starts, right? All of these things happen at once and people, you know, get something on the record, they can't get a job. And those are the folks who've just cycled on through. But if you think about what's been going on for the last 10 ish years, the economic recession, war is ending. Um, it's still disproportionate, it's getting some better but you think of crack versus powder cocaine. So the differing uh, um, sentencing between someone who uses crack cocaine, typically black or brown, someone who uses powder cocaine, typically white. Um, there are different, different sentencing that's happened. And there's been a lot of talk about parity around that. But all of those things combining suggest that we are at, at, kind of at the precipice of creating a whole new, and you see this in the shelters, a whole new chronic homelessness population right now. That if we're not careful, we'll start to age just like that disco generation of baby boomers age and kept aging. Again, small population, huge impact over the whole system and over their lives. It's cleaning you know, happen because I would think that <clears throat> you would want to see without those numbers. You would think. <laughs> so it's just the way. <laughs> Yeah, it, I think there are a variety of reasons. I think that's a lot of it. It is, you know, I and and then I've watched it happen really unintentionally, right? I, I, I'll, I've also, that's the part of me that just really struggles with that kind of moral reaction to it. But I've also watched our entire philanthropy system is set up on good outcomes. Oh, yeah. I can see where some social worker would feel like I can really help this. That's right. I don't know what to do. No matter what I do, they'll be back here. And I'm not trained for that. Yeah. I'm not trained to do, do to well, work with someone who has. Who you know who that's right. Help that's right. Help. That's right. And then there's often a financial incentive to do it too, right? Because the outcomes end up looking better. So it's complex, but um, there are reasons to there are reasons to question it and. It's what I think the cost studies that were going on were showing, it's really kind of not effective to do it either. Because you're, what, probably what's happening is you're giving too many services to folks who probably just needed a check and a little bit of support up front versus a whole two year transitional housing or program. Might done it, done it own, or might have done it on their own. Yeah. Well, they do it on their own. More affordable housing and uh, oh, heck yeah. living wage. I mean, yeah. the number of hours you should have to work to live is just, it, it should be so many. But 113 just to pay the rent. So, how many do you need to live? Oh, yeah. Like every hour. No, that's not actually the 113 is to get a housing. That's considered to, to be able to afford a housing with only paying 30% of your income. Oh, okay. 
So that's so already that's that's, that, that's so factored in a little bit. Just to live in, in fairly poverty kind of, yeah. kind of situation. But I mean that's that that's not fixable. I mean the rest of it's not fixable when when many, many people are having it. Now, maybe some of them need training and get into better jobs or whatever, but if you don't have enough houses for them to live in, and if you have to work more hours than is physically possible to work in order to afford the houses that are there, mm -hmm. yeah, then it's the big system is never going to get fixed. Yeah. But helping the ones who need the services getting the house first is just is a project that's useful. Yeah, it is. You can slide in there too. I'm a real estate broker. And 20 years ago, it was 25% of the income. Yeah. Was considered yeah. So now they know it's going to take 30% of the income. Yeah. No. And let's see, I think uh, I'm, I'm seeing that line graph in my. Uh, and, you know, the other thing I'll attach to this is the recent um, housing report. I'll put that at the end too so you all can look at it. But the number of people who are cost burdened who are paying over 30%. So it's like at 80% of folks who own under, but no, it's 91% of folks who, who earn less than 30% of AMI are paying over 30%. And a good sub, a good over 50% of those folks are paying more than 50% of their income. The rent eats first. Yeah. But even 30%, I mean, 30% 25 probably has a little but for a for a long time, food's been getting, I think, more right. affordable, at least with the subsistence yeah. food. But post COVID, food is, food is, food is yeah. way yeah. more expensive than it was oh, a year ago. Because of the supply, the yeah. supply chain. Yeah. And, so yeah. and they said it's not going to get fixed anytime soon. Yeah, if nothing else changes, your 30% just became. Yeah, and SNAP benefits. Food well, there's stamp no, benefits. no grocery stores there anyway for them to get to. Yeah, so. food stamp benefits have increased, but probably not enough to counter the the cost we're all paying. More. I mean, sometimes I'm like, wait, <laughs> that was from two bags of groceries. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, you should have trouble meeting my minimum on the whole whole foods delivery, but I've been meeting it very easily. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Do you think the consumers are waiting somewhere? No, I don't know that stat off the top of my off the top of my head. It is a very small percentage um, of the overall population who's homeless. Um, I want to say it's under it's under five percent. When you talk about the percent of the processing of the time yeah, it's a it's a point in time, and actually, yes, it's a point in time count. So the federal government. That's right. So the federal government um, counts homelessness in a few ways. You'll hear folks doing a point in time count, which we didn't do last year because of the pandemic. Um, but they'll go out for three, one to three days in January to count who's in shelter and who's on the street, and that becomes your point in time count. There's also a cumulative account that you can, we've started to be able to do. So the other hat that I wear is um, I run an integrated data system that pulls data together from different systems. So you can look at a family. We know people don't experience problems in one, <laughs> in one little area, in one organization. They often ex are connected to multiple organizations and the ability to look, use data and look across those organizations. So homeless management information systems um, is a large part of um, um, what was required by the federal government through the McKinney Vento Act. Um, and that allows us to count cumulatively over a year how many people have been in shelter. And so right now you can go onto the Mecklenburg County Housing website, which is um, where I'm sending you here. And you can see a one number for the month, how many people were counted homeless, homeless through that number that's, that means they've been in shelter or they've been done, gotten, somebody's gotten in touch with them through an outreach team. So we do keep account of that now, which is a little bit better. Um, but I think it's over 3,000 now on any given night who are experiencing homelessness. And so I'm not quite sure what the, the one number is this month. <coughs> Counting is a real issue um, because the population is so transient. <laughs> And if you count people over 10 years of use, 
why don't we look for some people? These guys are they go with different people. So yeah. in 10 years you have 800 of those that are only 20 of these. So that's like two percent. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. A couple of people yeah. who are homeless at any point during the time yeah. when you are chronic is definitely going to be lower. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, yeah, then that's um it really is an interesting that was really foundational to really help us think about how different groups use a different you know use the system differently or utilize the system differently um and it, it, that that big insight there was a piece of it plus what sam was doing in new york those two things together completely started to shift the system how do you think about this from a numbers perspective and and so but it, that can't be the only as we kind of found out through the you know the bush, bush administration's first effort is that can't be the only thing through Charlotte's first effort. That can't be the only thing. Um, it, if you're just focusing in on chronic homelessness, everything else can continue to, you're, you can still have many more people cycling through um, who are really struggling. Um, so it really is, there's some days where I'm, the hopeful thing is, is we know there's so much data now on what works. Actually putting people in a housing works putting the right amount of, of services around them works. Um, so, but we just have to, we have to create the housing and we have to be intentional about the services. Cause I do think a lot of folks have said, oh, we'll just put people in housing. There are folks who do need services and those need to be available and accessible. Expanding Medicaid would help with that um, because some of those services could then become reimbursable. How is that controlled? Because I think it would be a very case by case case by case basis. So it's very hard to create like one or even ten criteria that you know, categorize people who needs this service versus this service. It it is, and that's the that's um, Sam and one of his board directors, who's another social work professor at NYU. Um, they they did a book that was really about kind of the scaling of innovation and how this innovation really took over the country. But there's also something that happens when, when an evidence-based practice is, is implemented and scaled, but not everything about it is scaled, right? And so there have been, there's been a lack of fidelity to the original model that got the good results in a lot of cases. And that's why you see some of those numbers slipping about maybe those people didn't remain housed. Um, and so, um, yeah. Um, See in the back rooms right now, so pretty much you shut down for a minute to so you mark the camera and leave by the call. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you weren't here to hear. <laughs> yeah. Well, otherwise, I'd just stay in the dressing room rest of the night. <laughs> So prior to COVID, I used to travel all around and, you know, pretty much any city, you notice the homeless, the panhandlers, and everything. But when I was in Salt Lake City, I didn't. And I asked them about it. And they said, because they have such a wonderful service there for the homeless, that even the, the transients keep coming back to Salt Lake City because they offer them health care and dental and all sorts of stuff. So I that's what I was going to ask. But, you familiar know, with what they do. So. Yes. So they are one of the first cities to have have, and I'll explain what this means in a second. To have ended chronic homelessness. So I'll explain what that means, which is not like it's gone away. There's some. There's a little bit of hair splitting here. It's called functional zero, which means that you have you are when someone comes into chronic homelessness you're immediately moving them out and you know the names of the people who are chronic and you have them in process for housing at that time so you've worked through your wait list so salt lake city has done that and they did it by using housing first they applied housing first across their community it's also a smaller community um and um and they just had i can't remember the, the man's name but they had an amazing advocate who just did a whole heck of a lot of work around that community. But they were one of the, Salt Lake City is known um, for ending um, for ending chronic homelessness. Yeah, because they one said- One of the few major cities in the country. They said even with some of the transients, they'll be in Salt Lake City for a while, they wander off to another city, 
but they always come back. Yeah. Because they get such great care there. And that's, that's you know, that's interesting because that's a part of both. There's a there's some truth and myth in that, which is interesting because there's a <clears throat> listen to any city council, county commission around the country when people are talking about homelessness and they'll say, if we build it, they're going to come. If we build a service system, they're going to people are going to come here. And so that's often an argument to not build a service system, right? And so research is we did this when I was in Richmond. We haven't done it here. There are some that do that. You know, there are some folks who come for the services. Typically people are coming for, for jobs, for seasonal work. Yeah. Um, certainly in a place like Salt Lake City, that's a, a case. So there are some folks who come like that. The vast majority of the folks are typically right around that area. I would say it's probably a little bit different for a New York. So New York has shelter on demand. They have, a, they have a very, diff, they have 60,000 people who are homeless every night, 60,000. Um, New York, LA are our two biggest populations for homelessness. Um, Miami has a very low population too. Um, weather related to some extent for New York, I mean, LA, but it's part of its shelter on demand in New York where you look, you have the New York, Department of Health and Human Services has to provide a place for a person to stay, right? And so that means they're often renting out hotels, but it has really created some weirdness in that entire system to where it's made it really hard to implement housing first broad scale um, because of just, it's just, it's, you know, so there are people who get on a bus to go to New York because they can get shelter. Well, I was going to ask you, has there been any talk about trying to get a network? So like here in Charlotte, there's not enough houses to put these people out. Mm -hmm. But what about working with other communities that do have the housing and maybe moving some of the people to those communities and getting them set up? Sometimes somewhere? that works. And sometimes it's people will use bus tickets and reunite people with family or, you know, or put people back in places where they can be networked and supported by networks. But the interesting piece about that, it takes 113 hours to, to work part time, uh, to work uh, full time on a minimum wage salary. There is no county, zero, zero counties in the United States where you can work minimum wage and afford a one bedroom apartment a fair market rent. Zero counties, rural included in the United States where you can work a minimum wage job and afford fair market rent. And so it's actually, of course, it's better here than it is in New York or San Francisco um, or even D.C. Of course, it's better here, but it's not great anywhere else either. And so we're feeling people are feeling this pressure all over. And so they're they're just limited. There are there are reasons to do that um, that have more to do with family reunification. And if you have an in somewhere and, you know, having worked in this world, it is such a chronic crisis mindset that you are just trying to you are problem solving problem solving problem solving all day long every day every night that's right it's so gone it's trickled on up right yeah and that is it that's a very it's because of the influx of people and so many yes so if you look at the, the housing mismatch, what you'll see is people with higher incomes renting the, the apartments and the units that are affordable to people with the lower income. So it just pushes people out, right? And they're still not enough for folks. There's, there's like a 20,000 gap for, um, for folks who have, are more of the working poor. What happens with the yeah yeah i mean so are you asking are you at so that so that stat about no county across the country yeah that is from the out of reach report by the national income housing coalition 
So they take that they take the local wage into consideration. And so is, is that what you're asking? Yeah, essentially that's what I was asking. Yeah. What would it take to actually get to the point where a full time minimum wage worker could mandating that the CEO could not make more than 10 times the lowest pay worker? <laughs> yeah. It's gotta take something yeah. serious like that because you know the companies are too greedy now. Yeah, and I think it's you know it's odd, it's the housing, it's supply. It's a supply piece and it's affordable. It's an affordability piece. So I don't think, I don't think fixing one of those things is actually going to, I don't, I think we could create $15 an hour in Charlotte tomorrow. And I don't, we still don't have enough housing. Right. Cause remember a person already that. So if you have to work 113 hours at 750, 750 or whatever it is right now, an hour, um, then that's still you're having to work, you know, still a lot. Um, so, so yeah, I think it has to be there. We've got to figure out the affordable housing thing. We've got to figure it out. And we also, I think a part of that is, so that's also revolutionary too, just that we're having that conversation about homelessness versus these are just poor, sick people, right? Uh, they're not housing, they're, they're, one, one argument is they're not housing worthy. One argument is they're not housing ready. One, you know, or, I mean, so it can be very benevolent and generous even. And people kind of have that perspective that these, these folk can't be housed. Um, but research has kind of changed that and it's helped us to look at all of this as a continuum, right? So housing is a continuum and it's really, we've kind of artificially separated the folks at, as there's a separate kind of population of people who are who are homeless. And the only place that that might be just a little bit true, and that's even squishy there is this chronic homelessness population because all those vulnerabilities are coming together. Um, but even that, there are plenty of people we know, you probably know plenty of people who have mental illness issues but have a network support, supportive enough to get them out or substance use, right? Money makes a huge bit of, uh, all those issues, money makes a big difference mm -hmm. about the kind of care you can get, how low you sink, you know, this, it is about the social safety net. If you have, if you have a financial and a, and a family safety net, you don't have to get into chronic homelessness. When and we so, go back to our Pradeep's question, I know you, you touched on it, but can you maybe explore a little bit more about this the, is yeah, <laughs> by the way, yeah. Um, they might have guessed. <laughs> <laughs> about the social cost or the other way around I think the social benefits of getting people outside of homelessness mm -hmm. and what the positive externalities of that may be. That, that was your question, right? Yeah, that was my question. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to help in terms of dollars, so in terms of just the housing fees, but this shows the fact of Putting somebody out of the joint or the outcome the homelessness into the workforce. Yeah. The well, that's going to be longer term than some of these studies were, though, because you yeah, you definitely. Whole city in Charlotte, what do you right? think of these cities that are using tiny house communities and and then put services on site? Yeah, I mean, I think I do think the 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 I don't think it's going to be one type of housing that's going to solve it for every everyone. I know people with a lot of wealth who want to live in a tiny house. <laughs> <laughs> One of our members lives in a tiny house. <laughs> it's a really big tiny house. Um, and it's so, nice house. you know, I think it's, I think anything that puts people in close proximity has the capacity to warehouse the poor. I think we always need to have that in mind. Um, if people choose to live in proximity to each other, I think that's stronger. I think, all, you know, I used to be much more of a strict kind of people choose where they live. And I still believe that. I still believe that's the most effective way for people to work their way toward recovery. Affordable housing is such an issue now. And I've also heard people say, I'll live on Rachel Street or Rachel Avenue until, because it's better than, you know, being assaulted on the street. And that is, 
How many houses have the, the advantage of the shelters of, of um, privacy? Safe, safe, privacy and yes. safety. Yes. And well, I do think they that can is, be moved too, yeah. easily moved. Yeah. Okay. No, I do I do think I, I think choice is a, a key, but I think there we've all <laughs> got to be thinking creatively about how to end this. But back to the social um the social benefits thing, I it makes me think of this study called Lost Einsteins. I don't know if you've heard of that study. If you've heard of uh, Ross Chetty, who did the um, uh, economic mobility study that ranked Charlotte 50 out of 50. Have you all heard of that study? Oh my goodness, that has so animated Charlotte since 2014 when it was named 50. It's not just Charlotte, it's all of us here. It's, it's the commuting zone. It's the 50th Metro out of the 50 largest metros in the country. And it was ranked dead last out of those largest 50 met where metros. You know you move, your stuff, move up beyond yeah. where your parents were on the, on the mobility, uh, on economic mobility. And we ranked dead last. It has completely animated the philanthropic set, set government set, the universities talking about economic mobility. I run a faculty fellowship program where faculty are researching on economic mobility from various disciplines. Um, but Raj Shea is an economist from Harvard, and he combined um, IRS records from across the country and um, census data. He got special dispensation to sit in a <laughs> windowless, not connected to the internet room so he could get access to our IRS information. And he combined those two and was able to see, to compare a, a um, a parent's income to their child's income as an adult 20 years, 20 to 30 years later. So he had nothing on any reasons why anything else. It's just a numerical answer. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it, they, they did find cor correlations, and I'll tell you that in a second. But, um, but it really, what it showed was we are doing really bad. You, so people who live in Charlotte now, no so if you were born, were. yeah, if you were born, in Charlotte, in poverty, in the 80s. Okay. I think that I think they were looking at folks in the, it was like the 80 to 86, maybe. If you were born in Charlotte in poverty, you have the least <coughs> chance of any of these large communities around the country of moving up the, the ladder to the top percent um, uh, uh, quintile of income. So, and sometimes that sounds like, oh, well, how about to the, you know, the top, the second, yeah. And it's, you only have a one in three chance of getting above the second quintile, right? And so um, it's really, and if you are black and you're born here um, in the eighties, you have a 2.6% chance of getting to the top quintile. If you're white, you have a 12.6% chance. It's bad in poverty period, right? So. But that 12% chance um, is similar to some of the highest mobile, like a Salt Lake City, which has a very high economic mobility rate. And their um, economic, their mobility rate for those poor kids is 12%. That's what white kids born in our area. So it really is a black um, issue. It is a, it, I don't wanna say it's a black issue. It, there, that's where economic mobility is affecting people um, the most. But we were ninth 50th out of 50. All that to go back to the lost Einstein study because he started to, and I don't remember the numbers on this, but if you just hit lost Einstein's and Raj Chetty, um, you could look into this because he really did start to look at what gets lost when these kids who have no opportunity to move up the ladder, what, how, how can we, he, monet, he tried to monetize that. Um, so it's a, it's, he's really interesting to, to, to follow. So I think we've not done that kind of work. Like what, what's get, what gets lost? What, what are we losing as a society um, from the positive social benefit? Now, I know someone who moved into More Place, which is our permanent supportive housing, um, our first permanent supportive housing facility. She, she bought her house within, she bought her own house within five years. Have you done that? Not, not in what was that? These are just like the people that you know. So they're just anecdotal. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. No, there's no, there's no kind of overall study really looking at that. I would just assume like a lot of what we know. We know that you know um, 
and I will say where there's probably more research on that is in early childhood. You know, we just know investments in early childhood pay off both in services that we don't have to provide, but then in positive impact on the economy and on society. And so, but we've not really done that on adults experiencing homelessness that I know of. That's a, I mean, it's a great question. How have you, have you been able to do like a, a vaccination with the, the homeless? There are, the, public, the health department is set up to do. Oh, so they've uh, yeah. around. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. obviously the people can't get the sites to get vaccinated. Somebody would have to go to them. Yeah, no, they had clinics set up for homeless folks um, as soon. And that was approved before the most of us could get um, vaccinated. Oh, that's good. As we say, I'm looking at the yeah. time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and so they already they already told me they locked the front doors and we have to go out the emergency. <laughs> That's awesome. But no, I'm not. But it's not an emergency. It. It's the SAR. Yeah. <laughs> so my last my last question, in case anybody else. So you have the guy at the corner that says I'm homeless and can use chain that goes up and down the cars, and then you have the other guy in the grocery store parking lot playing his violin because he's out of work and has three kids to raise. Is no, it's a real <laughs> violin. That was on next door so which place. one do you give the money to? <laughs> you know, I hear, um, I'm not always popular with the homeless advocates in Charlotte who are often like, there's a real change program that's run by Center City Partners and, and they suggest giving the change to a program instead of a person. I think that's a person by person decision. And here's why. We don't look at poor people in the face ever, right? We pass, no, we pa pass them right by. And I'm just, I think I really struggle with giving people permission not to look poor people in the face and say, give your money to program. I feel like that's a dangerous, I feel like there's something more in that human interaction, but I will say I'm a woman. If I have money in my pocket, I may give it. If I have food in my car, I may give it. There are also times that I don't because I don't know. And with COVID, people haven't had masks on and I've got given a lot less. I do think that's personal to me. Um, I, I think there's a little bit of danger in the, in the quick, like, make the change mean, well, you know, 25 cents to a, a homeless organization is not going to mean as much as 25 cents or $2 to a person who's hungry. Yeah. And you, can't really, you can't really test where your 25 cents to a homeless organization is going. And you can't test where it's going to go with a person too. They may indeed, they may indeed. And if I was homeless, I might too. I mean, you know, as a solution to that, she, get, she buys a fish yeah. to McDonald's. Yes, uh, that's a good idea. And somebody comes in to ask for money for food, she gives them the uh, gift certificate. And now, actually, with trick or treat, you can get those. You know that they hand out. I don't know if they still do, but back when I was a kid, you can buy the certificates for trick or treat that they get a free Happy Meal or a free milkshake or that something like that. But yeah, but but the thing, I guess the, the the main question is is how do you know? Because to me, I see those people out there, especially the ones on the street corners or the the, the corners that are panhandling and that to me that's what they are they're panhandlers and they're cons i mean they're that they probably sometimes they are and, they, and sometimes they're and, not and so well, yeah some of them do is you know and the reason why i think that is first, first of all i've seen like them uh, almost like a husband and wife and it's almost like somebody's dropped them off some of them have better clothes on than i wear yeah you know and it's just really hard, you know, it's really hard to know. Off job. Well, they could have, but, but also where they're doing it isn't anywhere near where there are services right. for yeah. homeless people. Well, so, I, you know, I always, I, you know, I am a kind of a system social worker, so I always think in ter terms of systems, that's the first place my brain goes. And so I also think about what we're seeing right now with the great um, resignation, right? So everybody's, people are leaving their jobs. People aren't going back to jobs right now. We're short employees. I, I actually that, drove my parents to Las Vegas this summer from Tennessee and back. Um, and that was every billboard. I was like, this is actually just really amazing to see every billboard help wanted, help wanted, help wanted, help wanted. Um, you know, 
what incentive do people often have to work in the seven fifty dollar job? Well, see, sometimes I I, I, I mean I'm give self money respect. on the yeah. I won't give money sometimes, on the street yeah. because I don't like I don't like people walking around in the streets. I don't think it's safe. Yeah. But one thing yeah. I try to do, and I'm not very consistent about it, but I try to tip generously because I think you know yeah. the yeah. people who are who are delivering your DoorDash or or whatever they yeah. might be doing. Yeah. There's no telling. Maybe they just like the convenience of the job, yeah. but a lot of them, I'm sure, are struggling to yeah. pay the rent. Yeah, I was thinking the self-respect thing the too, and I think how far you have to, you know, it's just, just that feels so painful to me to think of. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes people are belligerent. I mean, it's just, you know, it's. I just think it's very complex, and I think individuals have to make their own decisions. But I remember when I was younger, working two and three jobs just because I was, you know, minimum wage younger and, and, and to be able to pay the bills and stuff. And I did what it took yeah. to pay my bills. And here you have these other people that aren't going back to work. And it's like, really, I don't, I, I don't understand that concept at all. I can't sit around and well, expect somebody to wait on me or, or take care of me. I have to take care really of myself. Really, trying to figure out what are the, there's a lot of different reasons why they're not doing yeah, it. What's wrong right. here? Child care, care is not nearly as well, never well, well that's and, if, true. and the public we, and public schools being off and on if and if well, child care has no, those are three dollar reasons yeah. 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 Yeah, I'll no, tell those you, are very valid. The Zoom world is was I'm still exhausted with Zoom. <laughs> I have a great job and I'm like, get me out of this. And do you have young children at home? I don't. So you, you however exhausted you are, I think how exhausted I'm, you would that's, be if you that's so exactly right. I've had so much compassion. And and your other kid doesn't have I, yes, I have I've had so much compassion because I tell you, I have been spent with 10 Zoom calls a day. It's just back to back, back to back, back to back. I can't imagine, and I, you know, I'm also sitting in a ton of privilege. I mean, <laughs> you know, I get to work from home during a global pandemic and get paid. Um, and so, so yeah, but I think the complexity of it is what keeps me, um, Ruth, from just, I just know that there, every situation is bound to be just a little bit different. Um, and I just think that needs to be up to individuals on that. I think we need to, we probably need to, um, you need, probably need to think about a different policy response. I do worry about the danger of it sometimes. There have been times I've been afraid I was just about hit somebody. Um, and so that's always worrisome, but but yeah. Yeah, I guess I didn't think about it with the, you know, with the parenting and the, the schooling yeah, and things like no, that. Yeah, no, it's just people are juggling but, a lot. And transportation too. I mean, yeah, about it's the, the hustle. Trip. It's a, I don't know if you know that the stat on the average um, commute um, on a cat's bus is 90 minutes. Wow. So if you have to go in to the uptown, which is the, we have a spoken wheel system, right? So all of our buses, except for a very few, you have to go into the uptown to switch to go back out. Yes. Right. So if you're commuting to work, the average commute is about 90 minutes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I know. Well, that's what I just messaged Robert 